How's it going, y'all? What's really? up? We're out here doing a little consultation time and farm planning, permaculture planning, and you know what? Billy was so kind to come out with me to help me work on a property. We're trying to put in some things, and I just thought it would be fantastic to bring you guys along with me, and Billy was gracious enough to let us come along to his whiteboard moment. Yeah, man, usually it's a blackboard, but today it's a whiteboard, and this is where you want to make your mistakes. As you well know, this is where we want to make our mistakes, either on this or in one of these, which is, or on a sheet of paper, whatever the case may be, you want to make all your mistakes on here. Think about it. More importantly, pray about it, lay it out with flags, which I see you have right here, and then cogitate on it a little while and decide whether or not, because once you get hopping and popping on some of this stuff, you can't plant a tree and then say, man, I really like a swale there <laughs> because you're not going to be able to do it after. Well, you could do it after the fact, but not without a great deal of uh, frustration and pain. So make the mistakes right here. Sounds good. Man, I Apple, pear, and then we'll call these. These are all trees as we're looking down. Each one of these trees will have a guild. It's not absolutely critical that all of them have the same guild, especially the nitrogen fixtures. The beauty about those is that they have very few predators by and large. Your apple and pear are gonna have things that wanna eat them, but the cool thing about this nitrogen fixer and every other nitrogen fixer that's gonna be in this space is that they harbor all the beneficial insects that wanna harm your highly beneficial or your productive trees. So in this particular case, we're laying it out. Each one of these, let's pretend, has a guild around it. And we'll put this little, well, we'll make that an imaginary line that goes down through there. This line is basically the areas, we're gonna have mulch all within this area, potentially. In that mulch, we might wanna ask ourselves, if we do in fact have mulch, is whether or not do we want a ground cover that's edible. And for this area, you could probably grow strawberries out the wazoo, or you may just be happy with blueberries. It's totally up to you. You could even let the grass come in, but each tree will essentially have a guild, like the fingers of your hand, where it's like a band, okay? You got a lead singer, you got a bassist, you got a rhythm guitar, you got a lead guitar, and you got a drummer. But all of them work together to make that music, and that's the symphony we're trying to create on the ground, not where we do everything in a reductionistic Sadly, a reductionistic worldview, but in one where everything works with the other, where this nitrogen fixer benefits this apple, and this apple mutually benefits the nitrogen fixer. The apple benefits the pear. The pear benefits the blueberries around it. The blueberries, it, every single thing, all seven layers that these guys over there just happen to be taking down some of right now, where all seven layers work synergistically like the fingers of your hand. That's what I'm talking Boom. about. <laughs> Gotta love it. So bro, this is, when it comes to the blueberries and stuff like this, it can be within here, it can be, it could even be an afterthought, but it's gonna require more work. It's gonna require more, so we can have an edible ground cover if we wanted it, but you don't necessarily have to have it. We could put each tree in isolation. Now that we have an idea here, I'm gonna erase this. We're gonna cover a guild one more time. So the plan we're going for for this property real quick, these are trees, these are trees. And we're gonna have our NAP pattern, nitrogen, apple, pear. These could be anything else. We'll say apple, nitrogen, apple, pear. And every time we have an apple, it's gonna be a different cultivar, preferably. We're gonna have about 40 feet of space, at least between this row of trees and this row of trees. So we're gonna have about 40 feet between there. And then obviously we'll have subsequent lines of trees up and down here. And we're gonna have a sheep tractor, which we got plenty of it, definitely on this property. These are the ones I initially bought from Sheep Tractor Company. Very great idea, very great design. Might be a little bit heavy in this environment, but there are ways around it. So anyway, we got sheep tractors that are gonna tractor through this landscape. Sheep will be benefited as these trees grow bigger. They're gonna provide shade. These trees are also gonna provide food to a certain extent. But then the manure from these sheep, every time it rains, 
because we're going to kind of put this stuff on contour, all the manure is going to benefit everything around the tree. So it's the perfect symbiosis. It's kind of like we look out at what nature has, and there's a lot out there. We look at nature, and all we do is say, good Lord, tell me how you're doing it, because I want to bring it home and copy it. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. This is generally, this is a more um, ordered way of what you would basically see in nature, because it makes our management a little bit easier. But anyway, the trees are here. The sheep tracked her through the landscape. Three days later, chickens are right behind them to stop the parasite load and also to spy everything that's going through here. If we're doing it right, we're not looking to be sustainable. We're looking to be regenerative. And this is how it's done. This is, this is one of the ways in which we do it, where you don't have anything in isolation, where everything works with something else in this landscape. Now that we got that, we'll cover each individual guild. So here's our basic guild. I'm going to draw a tree. This is the trunk. Let's say it's got a main trunk on it. So around every tree, we're going to put blueberries. And we're going to just put a B here for blueberry at opposite corners. And then over here, we're going to put a nitrogen fixing shrub. Okay on opposite corners. That could be sea buckthorn. It could be any number of things. Inside here, within 8 to 12 inches, we're going to alternatively put daffodils and garlic. And part of that being that the daffodils, when you have voles or anything like it, or you have deer, any browsing thing, they detest daffodils. So that's a nature's kind of repellent. You can't entirely trust it, but we put it there. And then also around here, we'd like, because we all, it's not just a matter of just putting in things that are functional, which has always been one of my colossal mistakes. My wife convinced me that we need to put a beautiful element in here. So in addition, on the outside, we got this inner ring of daffodils. Remember, we're going to protect this tree like the president of the United States. Yeah, there's a joke in there, but I'll leave it alone. But we have rings of defense. So we got one inner and outer ring of daffodils and we're gonna do the same thing out here, but we might throw some tulips in there too. You can do the same thing on the inner ring. So now we got that, we got that covered. Now inside within this tree, there's any number of ways we can go about it. Around every tree, we always put rosemary, thyme, and oregano. Yeah, not only is it good for you, it's good for them. You can make a lot of great oils out of these, plus they're really, really awesome for the beneficial insects that you want to bring into this. So there's another thing we're going to put in there. Now, what's key in every design, because we're trying to make a design that mimics nature, nobody goes out there and mulches anything in nature. So we want to make sure that we do the a similar thing here. Now the way we go about it is growing a dynamic accumulator called Comfrey. And that's over here, Comfrey. We put two at least around every single tree. And the reason is, as that shrub grows, it accumulates in its leaves all the wonderful things that are down in that soil that nothing else can reach. We chop it off and we throw it at the base of this tree so it's a self-licking ice cream cone. That's exactly what we want. And if we really want to get high speed about this, in the very same ring, in the mulch ring, this is something I haven't yet told Nathan, but I could even stick another nitrogen fixing tree, something that I'm going to do nothing more than let it grow in the same exact hole as my productive tree because it's going to take that atmospheric nitrogen and put it down in the soil in very close proximity. Every single year as it grows up, doesn't even matter. I could do it twice a year. These trees love it. I'm going to chop it off and I'm going to take my loppers. I'm going to throw it at the base and cover it up with a comfrey. So I never, ever, ever have to mulch this tree ever again. And don't worry, your daffodils and all that other stuff will grow up through there. So you only do it when the rainfall exceeds its evaporation or with the comfort you can do it as often as you like. So here's our guild so far. Now, only thing we haven't added to this guild is a ground cover. That could very well be the grass we're on. It could be a ground cover of any number of things. We like to make edible ground cover. 
So in all the space that isn't occupied through here, and if this is all wood chips, I'm gonna be putting all the strawberries I could possibly grow. They're, gonna, they're not gonna stay there, they're gonna grow out. The part of this is to let some of it be essentially maintenance free. So think about this, you got seven layers of a food forest, you got seven layers of a forest, any healthy forest, you got an overstory, which in the larger guild will have in the form of some of these trees. You'll have an understory, which is gonna be a smaller tree. So you're gonna have a tall tree and a small, smaller tree. Just like you'd see out there, you can see the tall trees out there and then below it, you can see the smaller trees. That's your overstory and your understory. Then you got your shrub layer. Okay, are we covered here? Hmm, yeah we are, because blueberries and sea buckthorn, they're all shrubs. So, we got a shrub layer. Do we have a herbaceous layer? Yes we do, we got oregano, thyme, rosemary, and that's only the small, I mean, we'll put other things in there like, good night man, my wife will, this, this is just a basic guild. We put this on every other tree, but she will put other things like wormwood and a number of other beneficial things that we use as medicine, but also can be used in these trees and also to treat our animals as they go through. Got a parasite issue? Let your animals mess with that wormwood a little bit. Or, you know, there's all kinds of wonderful things. We use oregano, thyme, and rosemary for any problems we might have with our poultry. We don't have a whole lot, but if we do, that's what we're using especially the rosemary, to cure any problems. So it's curing us, it's curing the trees. This is the beauty of being able to do all this stuff. And if we would like, our ground cover is obviously gonna be these strawberries. Now, there's a vine and a root layer in this too, okay? So what could I do? Not initially, but on down the line. All my nitrogen fixing trees, hmm, would it be a bad idea to go ahead and put some climbing yams? on every one of those nitrogen fixing trees, probably wouldn't be a bad idea. As my fruit trees become more robust and able to handle the weight, maybe I wanna grow some vines up there too. Maybe you have some other vining things that would passion not, fruit. absolutely. Yeah, Virginia passion kiwi, fruit. kiwi I mean, kiwi. absolutely. There's so many different ways. And so now our vine layer, I mean our root layer. Well, that's another part, do we have some as this stuff is growing, we could be growing root crops in between here. I mean, you could do something of what's called a, um, oh shoot, it's a syntropic sort of method where as these trees grow, we're putting annual crops in between them. We could do it any number of ways. The, all you need is a framework to go with. So the way I'm gonna look at it is everything within that drip edge and everything just on the outside of it, which is gonna be my nitrogen fixing shrubs and my blueberries, every bit of this real estate is pretty much occupied. I can decide whether or not I wanna put strawberries in here, which would probably flourish in an area like this. So right here, demonstrated in this picture, you got essentially all seven layers, I would dare say eight because mycelial layer, it's gonna be obviously in here. So all eight layers of that food forest are gonna be in this design. You know why? Because that's how the good Lord does it. And that's what we know of it. There's probably a lot more going on. Just when we consider the mycelial layer, it's not only the mouth of the forest, it's also the internet of the forest. I could do class after class on just that alone. But the beauty is if we model what we see in nature and put it in a interactive way close to our house, close to management. Think about it, through this design, we're gonna get a fruit crop, we're gonna get a nut crop, we're gonna get a meat crop, we're gonna get an egg crop, we're gonna get a, another meat crop out of the form of the chickens, all in an area that most people would say, oh, I can't farm, but yeah, you can absolutely produce more food on this, just this one area here is about three acres. You can produce enough food out in here to probably when it's mature to probably handle five to 10 families, I kid you not. And it ain't that hard to do. It's just seeing what we see out there and putting it to work here. Now the only thing, now that we have a design, we can go through with these and kind of get an idea where we want to put everything. So I, I asked Billy, one of the things I was asking him was about 
other things that I could put in here. Like I love currants. My family eats a lot of currants and a lot of gooseberries and even lingonberries. And these are some other things that you can plug and play into her. And we can use this as a framework as opposed to just adhering to the exact specifics, especially on the perennial bushes or trees that we can interchange as we go along in there. And so I was trying to understand what were some of the reasons behind that, whether it's taking care of the chickens, whether it's taking care of the sheep, but also taking care of the people that like variety too. Absolutely, that's the beauty about you knowing what I know concerning all these things. I'm picking rosemary, thyme, and oregano. That's our base for a tree, but for another one, it could be three other perennial shrubs. And we lean, we want to do as many perennials as possible. We don't want to be in the business of, in these systems, you want a self-licking ice cream cone. That's what we're designing in all this. It doesn't have to be rosemary, thyme, or oregano. And my ground cover doesn't necessarily have to be strawberries. Or, like you mentioned off camera, um, as opposed to doing climbing yams, what else would you want to do? I mean, yeah. passion fruits are one of my absolute favorites. You absolutely. Know? And I've got some varieties because we, we traveled all over the country for four and a half years in an RV. and we got seeds of all kinds of different stuff. You know, we went to sweet seed swaps and exchanges and we got to know farmers and we, we went to fruit clubs and, and vegetable growers clubs and we got these kind of more unique varieties. And I, I just, I know there's 6,000 varieties of things that want to grow food for people and we're generally buying nine. Two thirds yeah. of all of the, the yeah. stuff we buy is nine crops. And so my head wants to go to diversity to prevent disease, to prevent predation from pests. I understand that's kind of like, that's our camouflage layer. You know, that's exactly as much as, what it is. As much as what you're describing in here, I'm seeing the different insulative factors that you have to protect it and others that are medicinals, you know? And so we can plug and play different options as we go along in there, that, right? In fact, that's highly preferable. Mm -hmm. I'm given just a basic template of what you could go by. You could put that around every tree if you like, but you would be better served to do exactly as you're talking about. The higher the diversity, the better it's gonna be. And we're gonna also want, and this is gonna sound crazy, you wanna grow lots of poisonous things mm. because I have yet to see an animal kill itself eating something poisonous when they had an option to eat something that wasn't. Wow. So they will only kill themselves if they have no other options. But you wanna have that availability of things like well, I mean, devil's trumpet, wormwood, some of these other things, the animals will partake just, they know Dosage. how to titrate this stuff. Yeah. You and I don't, mm -hmm. not generally, but they're gonna know exactly how much to partake. So you're gonna wanna grow all these things that everybody tells you not to, but maybe not at first. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the cool thing is, is that you can substitute, do you have to have blueberries here as your shrub layer? I'm only suggesting it because I know you got a lot of acid out here I know it's gonna work well in this environment, plus they're a superfood. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to beat. Nitrogen fixing shrubs. I'm also yeah. picking things that, I mean, there's a bunch of them you could pick from, but I'm picking things that not only feed you, but feed your animals. Yeah. If you're going by there and let's say, well, it's getting a little too bushy, you wanna throw it into this tractor, well, the tractor's just several feet away. So we're utilizing zoning. Mm. We're utilizing every single dog we can bring to the hunt to make this, the reason so many people get out of farming, I'll be honest with you, is because it's a nightmare if you poorly design it. If you can just make this thing make fun where you wake up in the morning as I do, as you do, get out there and say, okay, man, hmm, I'm gonna take on the day and I'm gonna love what I'm doing. And it's not hard to do when you have a good design that is efficient, that works exactly the way we think it ought to. Yeah. Now that we got a framework, Look, man, I brought some myself. I didn't. I forgot you live by that Boy Scout motto. <laughs> motto, so you're prepared. Always. Always. So, what do you say we walk some of these out that and get an great. idea? I, the other, the other thing I wanted to ask you too. Oh, I just, I had a, a question about. Um, you, you mentioned something about consulting, Billy. You've said this to me a few times off camera, but I, you, you gave a, a reason as to why you don't really do this anymore, and I would love for you to share that about following instructions. <laughs> and about the preeminent focus that, that people lose by doing things their own way after they have somebody that's done it before successfully, not listening to their advice. What, that's, what was that about? That is, about that. that is why, I mean, you can make a lot of money consulting if you know what you're doing. I don't care what people are paying anymore. I either do it, I mean, I just won't do it for no amount of money. And the reason is, the number one reason is, I'm in this to evangelize this magnificent design science but above all that but above all that my lord and savior but permaculture really is my passion and there's no bigger frustration to me than doing this kind of work 
knowing you put in all this head work, yeah, am I being paid for it? That's fine. But if you're not going to do it, I don't want to waste my time because the money is fleeting. What we put in the ground right now could be here for generations. You're talking about chestnuts. I mean, they'll be here for your great, great, great grandkids yeah. if we do things right. So I'm not at all, this is why I got out of it where people will not do what you suggested and then blame you for what they didn't do. Even though you put it down in black and white what it was supposed to be. So it's important. It's, it is a profound value that whenever you do, you are wise to call in other eyes, whether me or anybody else. Because the last thing is like a doctor treating their own family. Mm. It's the same thing when it comes to something that you're emotionally close to. You can't see it objectively. You can't see it the way somebody on the outside would. So even if you come up with your own design, it's best to let somebody else overlook it and say, eh, don't think that's going to work out, bro. Or I think you ought to tweak it this way or that. And then find yourself, you, if you can't do this dispassionately, mm -hmm. you're in for a long road, nephew. I'm dead serious. If you, yeah. can't, if you can't dispassionately look at it, there was one guy in particular, he was a doctor in Texas, insisted on putting chickens in zone five which basically that is wilderness every one of them got killed the first batch every one of them got killed by coyotes and then i couldn't explain to him why this is happening and you know he wouldn't he had more degrees in a thermometer but didn't have any common sense when it came to stuff like this so just because a person has certain credentials or whatever the case may be it doesn't mean that they necessarily know what they're doing so for basically no amount of money mm. well i come out of retirement <laughs> I'll come out and help somebody like you, um, but you already have a basis of understanding of a lot of this stuff. I can tell when we talk that mm -hmm. you're not a Johnny come lately to this and I'll lay out whatever I think is supposed to happen. But ultimately you're going to say, you know what? I like this. I don't, I do. I don't. And I know that you're going to make probably every decision on a pragmatic basis and not on the basis of, Oh, this just feels like I ought to put this over here. Mm -hmm. You can have those feelings. You can do all that. But from a design standpoint, this has got to be absolutely dispassionate. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can be passionate about are the individual elements okay. that you put into it. Mm -hmm. But if your, back, if your backbone is wrong, this will be a living nightmare for anybody that has to manage it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty awesome that you're looking to do this the permaculture way because, number one, the idea is you won't have any concern about, did I put enough fertility on the ground? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have to worry about that because the trees and the sheep and all of, you know, the soil food web, all of that's going to do the work for me. I just need to get everything off and running. I need to make sure I'm not using chemicals. I need to make sure that I'm rotating properly. And these sheep tractors are a great barometer to do that. You don't necessarily need them, but it's not a bad idea to have them. So, um, plus it teaches you how to graze. It yeah. really does. It teaches you how to graze. And you can always let them out here, let them running around. But yeah, man, you got, you're doing everything the right way. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen with it. And I'm, I'm just astonished by how this thing's unfolding already. It's Absolutely. a beautiful place, and uh, you're doing the right things. Well, and, I, and the, re the reason I ask you that is because as I traveled around to these different farms, I got to see the bottleneck of frustration mm -hmm. as, as farms scaled up. As, as productivity increased and, and the, the yields began to increase, I got to see those little tiny headaches mm -hmm. get turned into monumental life-ending frustrations to where sections of farms were almost abandoned because they became so complicated and so convoluted because there was, there was a, a gal there who had taken a lot of courses on farm design who came in and she would count her steps everywhere she went across the property for tool for every tool she picked up every seed every thing of water timer i mean she was meticulous at counting steps and that's one of those areas that when most people just go out to to put in a garden they never even thinking about where's the water where's the tools where's the feed where's every one of these components is what gets people out of the game you know i've seen that law of attrition with people at entering yes. the homesteading and they've got this cycle of like the excitement in the beginning yep. and then there's this precipitous die off mm -hmm. of interest and i and i and i'm really convinced more and more everywhere i've gone it's because of the placement of these small things whether it's zone 0 like you're talking about and zone 1 like we're in basically zone 1 and edging towards zone 2 which is so much more easy to go outside even when it's raining or snowing or whatever, you're still motivated to get out there as opposed to it being, like you said, in zone five. Mm -hmm. you, you go there once a month, you know, yeah. and, that's, and that, that level of neglect wears on people. Well, in addition to that, we've seen the same things even when it comes to gardening. We had one lady 
and this was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back for me was that um, she didn't want her vegetable garden close to the house, even though that's where it should have been because she was concerned uh, and a rational fear of snakes as if the snakes aren't going to get the memo out in zone three. And so they're stretching out cords a hundred, I mean, a thousand feet of not cord, but a hose oh, man. just to water. Yeah. Then of course you got a water pressure problem. You got yeah. all kinds of problems. So it's, it is critical to put the things that require the highest degree of maintenance close to you. Mm -hmm. So here we are where we're, like you said, we're, well, you rightly said we're definitely approaching zone two, zone one, depending on how it goes. Just on the basis of this, this design, just knowing that you could walk out your front door, walk over here and do everything you need to do for the day. And I envision if it's set up right, it shouldn't take more than 30 minutes a day to manage this. Yeah. Notwithstanding the times when you're going to harvest, mm -hmm. but you got a little bit of time between, you know, when you set it up and when you get to that point, but yeah, you got all the options in the world. You got all the, this can be so easy in terms of your daily management. If you just, as you said, put things where they belong, take an accountability of your time, which is Joel Salatin's big on this yeah. is that, don't tell me how much you made on raising those chickens. Well, did you calculate your time to do it? And if you don't do that in terms of, okay, how long did it take you to push these sheep every day? How long did it take you to do all the other things that mm -hmm. need to get done? Carry water. <laughs> exactly. All those things, yeah. unless you have, you know, a means to do it more efficiently. So yeah, those are things that have to be considered. If you don't do that, the number one reason, as you said a moment ago, why people in my opinion, I think people abandon this lifestyle. The number one reason is without a doubt, poor planning, poor zoning, and they emotionally put these things in place without considering the consequence of putting those in those places. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to avoid. Cool. Well, let's, let's pick our spots then. Cool.